Welcome back to the playlist on organelles of the cell. Okay, so in this video we're going to go over a really cool organelle known as the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. So in the last video we looked at a few of the functions of the rough endoplasmic reticulum, but this video is on the smooth ER. Okay, so this organelle right here, oftentimes what you will see me refer to it as are the following. Uh, usually people will call it either the smooth ER, or sometimes they even shorten this to SER. Usually I'll write out or say smooth ER. Okay. Now the question is, why is it smooth? Well, the rough ER had ribosomes. The rough ER was a major uh, source of modification of proteins, along with the Golgi apparatus. Although the rough ER had the ribosomes, and that's what gives it the rough appearance when you look at it under a microscope or something like that. Okay, But the smooth ER, in contrast, does not have ribosomes, and so it doesn't have that rough appearance, and so they called it smooth ER. Okay, so um, the smooth ER has two main functions, Okay, and oftentimes people sort of neglect these functions. You don't get a lot of the background on it. Hopefully in this video we'll elucidate some of the really important uh, characteristics of what goes on here. The smooth ER really does two things. Number one, it's responsible for the biosynthesis of most lipids. Okay, when I say biosynthesize or biosynthesis, what a biosynthesis is, it's where you take really basic molecules that are floating around the cell and you anabolize them or you build them into more complicated molecules. So an example of a biosynthesis would be one for a molecule like this over here, which is called cholesterol. Okay, In no way are we going to go into cholesterol biosynthesis here, but I'll just mention that many of the enzymes that are involved in the synthesis of cholesterol are located in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Uh, this molecule shown down here, this is called estradiol. Okay? Estradiol is one of the primary estrogens. In fact, it's the main one. Okay. Um, whenever you say estrogen, understand that you're not talking about a molecule. There is no molecule called estrogen. Estrogen is actually a class of molecules. So you have estradiol, estrone, estriol, estrotetraenol. So est estrogen is a class of molecules, and this is just one of them. This is called estradiol. And the synthesis of steroids, like estradiol, there are, of course, many others. A lot of the enzymes that accomplish this are localized to the smooth ER. Okay? Now, many of you uh, want to go into fields where people are going to be on medication. So people who are going into nursing, uh, you'll oftentimes have to learn about what different kinds of kinds of medications do. I know for a fact there are pharmacology classes and things like that. Okay, oh, I know I have at least one person who's going into um, pharmacy, and you're going to be giving people drugs. Um, if you're watching this in the context of biochemistry, you know you might be going into medical school. Okay, so the question is, why do you care about the smooth ER? Well, the smooth ER, along with some other players, uh, is in large part responsible for drug detoxification. Okay, And there are high concentrations of smooth ER in two areas of the body. Okay, Number one, there's a huge concentration of smooth endoplasmic reticulum in liver cells, and then also in the nasal mucosa. Okay, Now, it's responsible for detoxi detoxification of drugs. I want to think about this for just a second. Okay, Why would it make sense for there to be a lot of drug detoxification processes going on in the liver and nasal mucosa? Well, if you think about how a lot of um, different compounds enter your body, well, number one, you can inhale a compound, in which case that compound will end up going through your nose. It will ultimately go into the epithelium there, and that is where you have a lot of smooth ER inside those cells. So if you inhale something that's possibly noxious, then that molecule will go through the membrane of the cell, go to the smooth ER, and it will get detoxified. And we'll talk about those mechanisms in a few minutes. Likewise, it's the same argument for the liver. If you eat something, 
It's going to go in your mouth and down your esophagus, through your stomach, through your small intestines, and ultimately get absorbed into the bloodstream. But the initial stop is through the liver. And so anything you eat that could possibly be perceived as toxic by your body is detoxified by the smooth ER in the liver. Okay, so that's a really important point is understanding where these organelles have high concentrations and why. Well, any cell that's going to be detoxifying drugs and foreign compounds needs to have a lot of smooth ER. And certainly the liver and nasal mucosa have that. Okay. And another thing that I want to just mention, this is not something that is super required or anything. Um, we have this big concept that you'll talk about in AMV2 called um, the immune system. And part of the immune system is well recognized to be antibodies. Okay. Uh, you may have not talked about antibodies yet. If you've taken microbiology, you probably have. Antibodies are essentially proteins that bind and help destroy foreign proteins. So if I think about an antibody, so let me draw a generic antibody. So this is kind of a rough sketch of what an antibody looks like. And the antibody is capable of binding things basically in these um, arms of the antibody. And when it binds certain proteins like casein or gluten, things like that, you get all sorts of proteins that assemble on the antibody and say the protein's part of a bacteria, it lyses the bacteria. So the antibodies in large part are what we call the large molecule immune system. So this is the large, large molecule immune system. But there are smaller molecules, like if you're if somebody's prescribing somebody Prozac or Risperidone, or even if you take something like morphine or oxycodone, something, something that you're likely to run into if you're a nurse or a, a pharmacist or a doctor, whatever, these compounds are not large molecules. They're small molecules. So the smooth ER has enzymes that we refer to as the small molecule immune system. So that's a very important point, something that's not really well elucidated. Large molecule immune system like proteins, the proteins are destroyed initially by binding by antibodies. Okay, But small molecules have to be destroyed by enzymes ultimately in the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. And a large part of this video is going to be devoted to seeing how they do that. Okay, but if you understand those basic concepts, you should be fine as we go along. Okay, so I just want to make it very clear that drug detoxification is done by the smooth ER, which is mainly done in the liver and nasal mucosa, and any one of the cells that's synthesizing lipids is also going to have a high concentration of smooth ER. So steroids are certainly um, one of the many types of compounds that you can encounter that are synthesized um, by enzymes in the in the uh, smooth endoplasmic reticulum. Now, one of the types of enzymes that's in the smooth ER is an enzyme known as it's known as cytochrome cytochrome P450. Okay, and when I say cytochrome P450, this is a class of enzymes. Okay, this class of enzymes can do unreal amounts of reactions. I'll give you some examples. Um, one of the reactions a cytochrome P450 can do is called hydroxylation. We'll talk about that. P450s can do hydroxylation. They can do epoxidation. That's another type of reaction. They can do demethylations. So they can remove methyl groups from compounds. And there's tons of other things they can do. Um, for example, there are many enzymes that are cytochrome P450 enzymes that are in the smooth ER that do reactions that cause the synthesis of steroids from cholesterol. So in no way do I require you to know all this. I'm just simply using this as an example to illustrate a point. Is that if I'm looking at 17 alpha hydroxylase, if I'm looking at 1720 lyase, if I'm looking at aromatase, if I'm looking at 21 beta hydroxylase, and there's certainly others, 
these ones that are shown in green and the ones that I starred, those are cytochrome P450 enzymes that exist in the smooth ER. And they all have slightly different functions. Okay, And in no way are you responsible for knowing this. I'm just using this as an example to drive the point home that lipids, like steroids, steroids are certainly lipids, are synthesized in large part by the smooth endoplasmic reticulin. And also, like I mentioned, enzymes that synthesize cholesterol, okay, a lot of those are also localized in the smooth ER. Okay, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. So steroid biosynthesis, and like I said, steroids are certainly lipids, a lot of those reactions occur in the smooth ER and they're catalyzed, like I mentioned, by these enzymes called cytochrome P450s. And oftentimes what people do is they'll give cytochrome P450s an abbreviation. It's called CYP, SIPs. So SIPs is just another term for cytochrome P450. And oftentimes what you'll see is there will be SIP and then there will be some number and letter designation after this, like for example 1A1 or something like that. That's just telling you which particular cytochrome P450 you're talking about. And there are certainly many, many, many types of these. And these enzymes have broad specificities. Now, one thing that cytochrome P450s are able to do is they're able to hydroxylate. So what does it mean to be able to hydroxylate? Well, to hydroxylate, it is their ability to add OH groups. So if I have some carbon atom that is attached to an OH group, this functional group is called a hydroxyl group. This is called a hydroxyl group. So what you can do is you can look at a molecule and you can look at the substrate of the enzyme. So the enzyme is given here. This particular enzyme is vitamin D25 hydroxylase. And sometimes the name of the enzyme gives it away, but let's kind of analyze this. If it tells you it's a hydroxylase, that means it's going to hydroxylate. Okay, so you look at the substrate on top, you look at the product on the bottom, and you say, okay, what's the difference between the two? Well, if you look at this position right here, let me do it in red, this position right here, all there is essentially is a hydrogen attached right here. But when I go and inspect the product, I notice that instead of the hydrogen, I'm left with a hydroxyl group there. So that's where the name hydroxylase in the name of the enzyme comes from. So what I can do on the test is I can ask you, what type of enzyme is this? What kind of either activation, biosynthesis enzyme, or degradation enzyme, what type of enzyme is this? So what you do is you look at the difference between the substrate up here, the substrate and the product. You look at the difference and you say, what's the difference? Well, I added a hydroxyl group to this position in red right here, so it must be a hydroxyl group. Okay. Now here, this was a biosynthetic reaction Okay, because this calcidiol is going to be hydroxylated one more time to make calcitriol. And calcitriol is actually activated vitamin D. Okay, uh, you'll talk about that more when you get to skin and so forth, and later in A and P2. But this example of a reaction was an activation reaction or a biosynthetic reaction for calcitriol. So something else can happen through the use of cytochrome P450s. You can also perform epoxidations. So what you can essentially have are double bonds. So an example would be something like this. So I have a carbon-carbon double bond. You know, there are things attached here. What I can do is I can use an enzyme called an epoxidase. Okay, so let me write that. This is called an epoxidase. In general, epoxidases are cytochrome P450s. And what you should essentially get at the end of this reaction is something that looks like this you should get this functional group right here. So when you see this sort of triangular structure, we have a carbon, a carbon, and they're bound in a triangle to this oxygen, this functional group is called an epoxide. Okay. Now, epoxides are one way to um, get rid of drugs. Okay. Certainly, um, lots of drugs that you find have double bonds. They have aromatic rings like benzene rings. So what you'll do is you'll epoxidate them, 
and then you'll react the epoxide with an enzyme called epoxide hydrolase. So let's look at the example down here. So what I'll have right here is something called benzopyrene. This is certainly a pretty complicated molecule. Then what I'm going to use is an epoxidase. This is again one of our cytochrome P450 enzymes and notice what happens. This double bond right here is what gets epoxidated. Notice the functional group I get. So I get an epoxide out of that. Okay. Then epoxide hydrolase is going to hydrolyze apart the double bond. Okay. So what I do is I use water. This enzyme is epoxide hydrolase right here. And my functional group that I get out of this, which is shown right here, this functional group right here, this is called a trans 1,2 diol. Okay, this is an important thing you need to realize because epoxides are not things that you want to keep around for very long. Okay, lots of drugs, lots of them um, have double bonds that you can epoxidate using cytochrome P450 epoxidases. And one of the problems with epoxidases is they form epoxides, but if that epoxide gets into the nucleus, there are components of DNA that can react with the epoxide, and that produces something called mutation. Now, the following for A and P is not something I require you to know, but if you're looking at it through a biochemical perspective, um, this is something that I, you probably should be aware of. Let me get rid of these things. Okay, so this, is, this uh, particular uh, slide is going to show you the uh, carcinogenic nature of benzene. So this molecule right here, this is this is benzene. Okay, benzene is our six-membered aromatic ring. You probably learned about benzene when you took organic chemistry. This right here, notice this. This is deoxy. This is deoxyribose. This nitrogenous base right here. This is our guanine. And then, of course, we have, you know, the rest of the DNA strand going up this way to the 5 prime and the rest of the DNA strand down here going down to the 3 prime end. Now, on guanine particularly, there's a nucleophile, okay? And the nucleophile, essentially, I'll draw it in green. It's this lone pair here on this amine that sticks off of the pyrimidine ring of guanine. Now, what can essentially happen is if you put benzene near the smooth ER, a cytochrome P450 epoxidase can epoxidate benzene, and I can get this molecule right here. So notice, notice the epoxide functional group is shown right here. Right there, that's the epoxide functional group. Now what can happen is this guanine amine can do a nucleophilic attack on this carbon of the epoxide and that causes the epoxide ring to open. And so now what you get, and notice I've abbreviated all this business over here as R, you get the guanine, right here, this is the guanine, in a covalent linkage to what was the benzene ring. This whole thing right here, this is what we call a mutation. Okay, It's also sometimes referred to as DNA damage. So benzene was um, a while back ago, it was classified as a carcinogenic, tetragenic um, compound, mutagenic, whatever. I mean, it's, it's a terrible compound. So you want to use it with care when you use it in an organic lab. You certainly don't want to inhale this. But when this guy gets epoxidated, it becomes very reactive. And if it ever gets into the nucleus, if it ever gets into the nucleus, guanines in particular can react with the epoxide and you can get this covalent linkage between the guanine right here and then this ring structure. And that's a mutation that causes DNA damage. And things like this are certainly repairable, but it would be nice if you just didn't inhale or ingest benzene in the first place. Now, if you epoxidate benzene, one of the nice things is that you have an epoxide hydrolase to get rid of the epoxide. So the thing that I want you to notice is that here, I'll do this in yellow, highlight, here we have the epoxide. That was, that was generated by the epoxidase, P450 epoxidase. 
But when I use epoxide hydrolase, I get this functional group right here, which is this trans 1, 2 diol. This is the process of inactivating the epoxide. So what I've done by breaking open the epoxide ring is I've essentially almost completely deactivated that functional group. Okay, So I turned the epoxide into two hydroxyl groups, drastically, drastically reducing its reactivity. And so now that I have this trans 1, 2 diol, it will not do this reaction. Okay, It cannot react with guanine. Okay, Because essentially from an organic chemistry perspective, the epoxide is a tremendous electrophile due to the ring strain of the three-membered ring. And so by eliminating the epoxide through epoxide hydrolase and generating a trans 1,2 diol, you completely obliterate the epoxide and prevent um, cancer from occurring. Now, this compound right here that I'm going to do in green, this compound's dangerous. Okay, this is called benzopyrene. Okay, benzopyrene, which I mentioned right here, is the chief carcinogen in cigarette smoke. So oftentimes benzopyrene is synthesized whenever you burn something that is indeed flammable. Um, certainly there are definitely things in cigarettes that are flammable. And benzopyrene is carcinogenic mainly due to the fact that it gets epoxidated by a P450. Okay? When it gets epoxidated, it becomes dangerously reactive. And as shown right here, notice what happens. It can form an adduct with a guanine residue in the DNA. It can do it in that way or it can do it in another way, which for all intents and purposes, it's basically the same thing. It causes DNA damage. So now what you have is you have a guanine in the DNA that's covalently linked to this guy right here which is extremely dangerous. So if I asked you, what's the purpose of epoxide hydrolase? It's to get rid of those nasty epoxides that are generated by the P450 epoxidase. Okay? And epoxidation also is important for getting rid of um, dangerous drugs that you take. Um, even medications your body classifies as dangerous, so it will do everything it can to get rid of it. Okay? And part of the strategy in doing these reactions where you generate hydroxyl groups is for what we're about to see. Okay, so notice what happened is in this reaction, notice I ultimately formed two hydroxyl groups. And what I can do essentially is I can epoxidate once again and use epoxide hydrolase again, generate more hydroxyl groups. And it turns out that from the body's perspective, the more hydroxyl groups you have, the better. Okay, so that's going to lead us ultimately, let's skip this slide, uh, ultimately to this slide, which is really important. Okay, the ultimate goal of hydroxylation and epoxidation is to add potential hydroxyl groups, to add potential hydroxyl groups that to serve, to serve two purposes. Okay. Hydroxyl groups are polar. I think from our studies of electrostatics, we realize that hydroxyl groups are polar. Okay, so if I have a carbon, an oxygen, and a hydrogen, we note that the dipole moment in both cases points towards the oxygen. And so what that does is it generates partial positive character on the hydrogen and the carbon, and of course, partial negative characters on the oxygen. So it's charged slightly and so that can allow hydrogen bonding with water okay why is this important well it turns out for two reasons number one hydroxyl groups add solubility and it turns out that you can generally only excrete drugs in the urine unless they're soluble okay unless you have drastically increased their solubility hydroxyl groups make the molecule more polar and more likely for the kidney to be able to excrete in the urine Okay, that's our ultimate goal. We either want the drug to be excreted in the urine or to go into the feces. And the only way we're going to be able to do that is to increase its water solubility. The first way we do that is by hydroxylation. But there's something else we can do to take that a little bit further. What if instead of just simply adding a hydroxyl group, we could add even more polar groups? far more polar groups than hydroxyl groups, and it turns out that we can do that. And we do it in two ways. Number one, we can react with the UDP glucuronosyl transferase, or we can react with a sulfotransferase. Okay, and we're going to look at those reactions on this slide. So this molecule that's shown over here, 
This molecule is called codeine. This is certainly an opioid that people could potentially abuse, but you can also take it as medication um, for things like relieving pain and so forth. Okay, so I want you to be able to recognize if something is a glucuron acetyl transferase, and this is what you do. Okay, um, you basically look and see what the difference between the substrate and the product is. What's the difference between the two? Well, I noticed that in the substrate, here I have this hydrogen attached to the OH group, but here the hydrogen's been replaced with this whole business over here. And it turns out that this molecule right here, or this moiety, is called a glucuronide residue. And notice that that glucuronide residue is this business over here on this molecule known as UDP glucuronide. In fact, UDP, UDP glucuronide is the gluc, glucuronide donor. Okay, It's always the glucuronide donor. And this type of enzyme that does a transformation like this is called a glucuronosyl transferase. So you look um, at this molecule gluc with the glucuronide residue and you say, okay, well, I see the glucuronide residue. I must know that this molecule codeine has been metabolized by glucuronosyl transferase. Okay, stuff like this becomes really important when you start looking into chemical literature. Because when you see a molecule like this, they're going to expect you to know what a glucuronide residue is and know that this molecule is metabolized by a glucuronosyl transferase. In a similar way, we can have a sulfotransferase. So a sulfotransferase, I'll do this in light blue, sulfotransferases transfer sulfuryl groups. So what do I do? I go back to what I said before. I look at the substrate and I look at the product and I say, what's the difference between the two? Well, once again, I notice that this oxygen has a hydrogen, and here it's essentially been replaced with a sulfuryl group. Okay, so if you're actually looking at what a sulfuryl group is, okay, it's essentially this. So I have a sulfate, double bond to oxygen, double bond to oxygen, single bond to oxygen, and then there's just some group over here. Okay, we don't know what it is. As long as you have that, that's what we generally classify as a sulfuryl group. And this group over here is actually usually an oxygen, okay, in most cases. So if you see this moiety being transferred onto a molecule, which is usually an oxygen it's being transferred onto, you know that was a sulfotransferase metabolic step, okay? Also, one thing that's also important is the glucuronosyl transferase is actually in the smooth ER, whereas the sulfotransferase actually acts in the cytosol, okay? But I want you to notice something that's actually really important, okay? Notice what happened, okay? The glucuronosyl transferase, what did it act on? Well, it acted on a hydroxyl group, right? What did the sulfotransferase act on? It acted on a hydroxyl group, okay? Going back to the past few slides, what have we been talking about? We've been talking about processes that generate potential hydroxyl groups. So part of the reason, part of the genius in the design is you epoxidate, right, going back, you epoxidate, and then you use epoxide hydrolase to generate a, a trans 1,2 diol. And that generates two hydroxyl groups from one epoxide, okay? And then on top of that, you can just do simple hydroxylations. Simple hydroxylations are certainly possible, like in the case of this enzyme, which is vitamin D 25 hydroxylase. So you can do simple hydroxylations. Okay. And one thing I just want to mention is that so reactions that are catalyzed by cytochrome P450, if you ever take a drug called Prozac, which is generally used to treat bipolar depression, um, heroin, morphine, all of these drugs, including ethanol, which is the active ingredient in alcohol, like beer and wine, all of these things are metabolized by P450s. Now, there's one more reaction that I want to talk about that's probably going to be of really cool importance to you, and that's actually metabolism of caffeine. Okay, If we go back to one of the previous slides, I was talking about all the different reactions that P450s can do, and the last one I mentioned was demethylation. So what is a demethylation? Well, 
for all intents and purposes, for our purposes, what a demethylation essentially is, let's say I have a nitrogen right here, and let's say that it's attached to a methyl group. By now, hopefully you realize that a CH3 group is a methyl group, okay? Well, if I do a demethylation, this is going to be catalyzed by something called a demethylase. And in many cases, P450s act as demethylases. That's one of the reactions they can do. And so if I demethylate, essentially what's going to happen is that methyl group will be replaced with a hydrogen. Okay? So if you were to demethylate this compound right here, you would simply replace the methyl group with a hydrogen. And that is called a demethylation. And many demethylations are catalyzed by P450s. And those enzymes are called P450 demethylases. Okay? So let's look at a few examples just so you can get the point. Um, notice here that this is caffeine right here. This molecule up here is caffeine. Look at this methyl group. Okay? If I was to demethylate that, that would be catalyzed by this P450. And notice that that methyl group gets replaced with a hydrogen. Okay? Let's look at another one. So let's say I was to want to demethylate this nitrogen. Well, if I demethylate that, what's it going to get replaced with? Hydrogen. Also catalyzed by a P450 demethylase. Let's look at another one. Let's say I wanted to demethylate this nitrogen. What's it going to get replaced with? A hydrogen. Okay. Again, catalyzed by a P450 demethylase. So caffeine is something that you probably drink on the ready. It's treated as a foreign molecule by your smooth ER. Okay. Particularly the P450s. It gets demethylated and then ultimately it will get excreted by the kidneys. So what's the ultimate goal? Well, what we're essentially trying to do is make the molecule as soluble in water as possible. Notice all the hydroxyl groups that we have on this glucuronide residue. This is even more polar than a hydroxyl group by itself. So what we've essentially done here is we've increased solubility to increase excretion. What did we do with the sulfuryl group? We increased solubility. That allows increased excretion. So hopefully that sticks with you. And hopefully you can identify if a glucuronosyl transferase acted on the molecule or a sulfotransferase. So if you have a glucuronosyl transferase, you get this characteristic glucuronide residue. If you get a sulfotransferase, you get this characteristic sulfural residue. And what can help you remember it is sulf represents the sulfur that's in the center right there. Okay? So let's get a little bit of practice. Okay? So in this practice question, we're trying to figure out what type of reaction this was. So the following reaction is a leukotriene activation biosynthetic reaction localized to the smooth ER. This reaction is a what? Well, what do I always default to? Well, I say, what's the substrate and what's the product? Okay? And what's the difference between these two molecules? Well, if you look at the difference, I think it, eventually you'll see it, is that here we have a simple double bond, and here we have an epoxide. Okay? Remember that our epoxide functional group is where you have carbon, carbon, and then this oxygen like that. Okay? Another way of looking at it is like this. It's an epoxide. So what kind of reaction is this? It's an epoxidation. Okay. So anytime you see a double bond replaced with an epoxide, that's an epoxidation. Okay. Here's another example. Okay. So uh, this molecule right here, this is called estrone. This is another type of estrogen. We saw estradiol earlier. And we're converting it to the molecule shown over here. So this, this right here is our substrate. This is our product. So what do we do? We look to see what the difference between these two molecules is. Well, hopefully you can see the difference that here I, on this oxygen I have a hydrogen. Here I have a sulfural residue. So the question is what metabolized, what metabolized estrone? Right, it's a sulfotransferase. Okay. If this were a glucuronosyl transferase, you would see a glucuronide residue attached to that oxygen. But this is clearly a sulfotransferase. Okay. Okay.
So the following detoxification enzyme in the smoothie are is a what? Well, um, there's two things we're looking at. Okay, um, we can go one direction towards the left to um, oxymorphone, or to the right, noroxycodone. Okay, and of course we're starting with oxycodone. So oxycodone is the substrate, and these two, this is product one, and this is product two. So what's the difference between these? Well, on oxycodone, I notice that, and by the way, on the test I would give you this. Okay, so I have a methyl group on oxycodone right there. I would give you that. So I have a methyl group there. I notice I have a hydrogen right here, right? So what happened? Well, I went from something that had an oxygen CH3, right? to something where it's an oxygen and a hydrogen, okay? Also, notice what else happened. Well, here I have a methyl group as well, and again, I would give you that this is CH3. I would give you that. So I have a CH3 on that nitrogen. Now here I have a hydrogen. So it's the same type of reaction in both cases, but they're just acting on different atoms. The yellow one's acting on an oxygen. The blue one's acting on a nitrogen, but it's the same thing. What type of enzyme is it? Right, it's a P450 demethylase, exactly what we talked about earlier. Okay, here's another one. Okay, in fact, we already saw this. The following biosynthetic enzyme in the smoothie are is a what? So this is an example of what? This is an example of lipid, lipid biosynthesis, lipid biosynthesis. So what type of enzyme is this? Well, what's the difference between these two molecules? Well, over here. There's nothing over here, right? Over here, I noticed there's a hydroxyl group, right? So what kind of enzyme is this? It went from essentially just having a hydrogen here, right, to having a hydroxyl group. By the way, I would give you this hydrogen. So what, what's, what kind of transformation is that? It's P450 hydroxylase, okay? So hopefully that made a little bit of sense. Um, in the next few videos, we're going to be going over things like the plasma membrane. We'll go over peroxisomes and lysosomes, and then we'll end with the mitochondria. So hopefully that gave you a little bit of intuition about the smooth endoplasmic reticulum. See you in the next video.